and apply your truth to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, um, my wife has, uh, has left me for the weekend and gone with Erica to do whatever girls do in Tennessee. They're hiking and having fun and all that stuff, taking a much needed break. And, uh, and getting just a little time to, to have some fun, and she's going to make up for it when I get home, amen, because I'm going to, maybe I'll, maybe I'll take a day off, and I'll go do what I want to do, which I, have, I haven't figured out what that is yet, but as soon as I do, but uh, it's been rather interesting at home, and last night I got all the kids in bed, and I needed to go over some things for Sunday school this morning, and, and so I got them all in bed, and after took a shower and got ready to go, and after a while, had the house pitch dark, I thought everybody was asleep, right? That is the plan. And, uh, and so I'm in my room, and I, I needed to go out, and I can't remember what I needed to get out of the kitchen, but it was over by the, over by the coffee maker. That's usually where all the good stuff is. And, uh, and so I'm going out in the dark uh, and trying my best to be stealthy, and so that where I come out of my room and the, the carpet is, is real creaky, you know, and I don't want to make any creaks. And then you get onto the laminate flooring, which is pretty solid, so I'm, so I'm stealthy and I'm sneaking. And just, you take that step and you, and you take all the, all the impact in your knees. And you just kind of, you know, I'm very successful getting across there, not a sound. And uh, then I'm heading toward the coffee maker in the dark. And then crash, bang, boom, I kicked Thomas the train <laughs> right, into, right into the cabinets. I, and, and in the darkness there, I remembered that just a few hours, just a few hours before, me and Cade had constructed a good-sized tract, and we left him out because Mama was gone. And, <laughs> and we can leave it out. And that way, we can play with it tomorrow, and I don't have to build it again. Amen? And so, see, I agree, and, and you got it too, but, uh, and so, you know, uh, things can be really a whole lot clearer and a, a whole lot more improved when you add light, and uh, I, I knew Thomas was there, and, and I, as soon as I kicked him, I remembered, I think I kicked Percy too, I kicked both of them, and uh, fortunately, I don't think anybody woke up, uh, I guess they were all worn out from the day, and Boy, it sounded, it sounded like an explosion, like an atomic bomb going off in the quiet of the night. But, uh, but uh, you know, I knew he was there, and if I had the lights on, I would have not had a problem. But everything, many decisions and many situations can be improved by adding light, and, and light's, light's impact upon darkness is total. When, when present, light drives darkness away. They don't coexist. And so our Lord commands us to be a light in the darkness of this world. And we find that commandment in Ephesians 5 and verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. There's our command. Now what is our purpose for being light in the world? Is the purpose for us to be happy? Will it be beneficial to us and make us happy? Or wealthy? Or safe? Or healthy? Well... I don't think that's necessarily God's greatest goal for us. Because if that was the case, then if God wanted that for us, the moment you trusted Him as Savior, He would have to take you to heaven to accomplish all that. Because that would work out better in heaven than it would here. And so God has a different goal for us as Christians. And the purpose of being a light in Christian is, as a Christian is to glorify God. That is, that is your purpose, that is my ultimate purpose in this world. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And then he says this, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. The reason... We are to shine as light in this dark world is so that we may glorify God. And when our light shines and when our light glorifies God, what happens? What does it accomplish in this world? What, what, is, what is God advancing that, that cause for? Why, why is His glory so important? Well, last week we engaged 
the command to walk as children of light, the one we just read. And when we walk, we learn that we take steps. That makes sense, right? And we, we spoke of three steps that we must take as we walk in the light. Do you remember those steps? I worked real hard to alliterate them so you would remember them. And so the first step is learning the light. Remember that? And we, we learn to identify what pleases the Lord and, and live accordingly. That is, that is really what the Christian life is all about. Finding out what's pleasing to God and doing it. We found a good test. Remember the test that we found that we can figure out what is pleasing to God and what is not? The, the, um, the test has three questions. I like, a, I like a test with three questions. It's not a whole lot to answer. And, uh, and unless it's an essay test, right? Uh, but the three questions to figure out if something pleases God is, is it good, is it right, or is it righteous, and is it true? Those three questions you ought to think about before you do anything that is somewhat questionable. Before you, before you click that post button on social media, you should ask, is it good, and is it right? And the third one no one seems to ask anymore is, is this true? All right, all, and the criteria seems to be is, does this make me feel good? Does it prove my point? And does it get the people that I want it to get? Uh, but no, every decision in life, every action should be put to this test. Is it good? Is it right? Is it true? And in doing that, we learn the light. What's pleasing to God and how can we live accordingly? Step number two was leaving the darkness. You can't live as a light without stepping out of the darkness. Be faithful to, to God and, and don't be a traitor. And don't, don't uh, uh, carouse with the enemy, so to speak, but leave the darkness. And step three was lighting the world. Lighting the world. That is our job. And those are the three steps we take when we walk in the light. Learning the light, leaving the darkness, lighting the world. Now, we were running short on time last week, oddly enough. I don't know how that happened, but... Uh, it was getting to be 11 o'clock or a little after that when we were getting into that third step of lighting the world. So I want to pick up with that third step where we left off. And we're going to talk about and expound a little bit more this morning on lighting the world. And we understand, um, we, we understand that we're commanded to be the light of Christ in this dark world. But I find it easier to... To, to, to do things when I understand what they're for. I mean, I understand that we're supposed to glorify God, but I also want to know what that does in this world. If I glorify God in Mawequa, Illinois, what, what is that going to accomplish for God, uh, practically speaking? And that's what, that's what the Apostle Paul really gets at here in the book of Ephesians in chapter 5. And so we're going to look at that in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. And we're going to read on through verse 14, and I really want to focus on verses 11 through 14, but we'll start in verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, providing, approving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. What must our light accomplish for God's glory in this world? When we, when we glorify God, what are we doing? What should it be doing? When our light shines, what should happen? Well, I want you to understand this. Our light must reprove the darkness of this world. We'll find that in the scriptures. When we shine as a light for Christ, uh, yes, it lights up darkness, but it reproves, it exposes. Um, our job, our function in this world is to light the darkness. Our light is a reflection of the true light, Jesus Christ. It points to God's glory, but in glorifying God, our light rela relates in a negative way to the darkness around us. And it reproves that darkness. The light is switched on. And when it is switched on, whatever was hiding in the darkness scurries across the floor looking for a crack or a crevice to get away from the light that has just exposed it. And I hope you've never had that experience of turning on the light and seeing things scurry. But 
that is really what happens in this world when the light of Christ is shining. And when it turns on, our light must reprove the darkness of this world. Go back here to verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But here, look at this command. But rather reprove them. For it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But the things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore, he saith, the wake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. I want to draw your attention really here to verse 11. Um, and and uh, having commanded us really in verse 11 to break off this fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, here's the command. Reprove those works of darkness. Don't just step away from them. Don't just stop doing them, but reprove them. And so, uh, reprove here translates the word allegco, and that, and that means to convince with solid convincing and compelling evidence. It especially means to convince and convict by exposure, to expose what is wrong. That's what light does. It exposes what was in the darkness. It reproves, it rebukes something by exposing its corruption. When your light shines in the darkness, it exposes the corruption that was once hidden in that darkness. In 2013, my Michigan Wolverines played in and lost the championship game of the NCAA tournament. I don't remember if that was close to a Sunday, but you might have been aware when I came dragging in the next Sunday trying to rejoice in the Lord. They lost to the Louisville Cardinals, but in... An external investigation has come up this year and shed some light on the recruiting practices of the Louisville Cardinals, even going back to 2013. The program and coach have been exposed, and they were found out to be cheating. That doesn't happen in Kentucky in basketball, does it? Um, they were paying recruits and doing all sorts of illegal things to gain a recruiting advantage. And because of the findings of the investigation, Louisville's head coach has been fired. The NCAA has announced that the Cardinals will have to vacate all of their wins, including the 2013 National Championship. What could not be seen, as they sang one shining moment to the confetti in 2013, what could not be seen then was hidden in the darkness, has been exposed by investigation now. And because of that exposure, justice was meted out and penalties enforced. That's how light reproves darkness. And that's, by the way, uh, does that mean that Michigan is now the 2013 national champions? I know there's a couple of sporting goods stores that are already putting shirts out there, and I might get one. And uh, so if you see that, you'll know the backstory. But uh, our light must reprove the darkness of this world. It has to expose. That's what it accomplishes. Now, is that really true? Wait a second, Pastor. I mean, if I, I, I'm not to become an investigative reporter or some kind of under, undercover type of person like that, am I? Uh, do we reprove sin just by, just by shining, just by living a holy life? Why should the world care how Christians live? You know, I often, under, I often ask that question myself in my mind. I ask lots of questions, but that's one of them. Why do they care if we don't drink? Why do they care if we don't go to the places they go or, or do the things that they do? Does this really work? Well, let me give you some proof that it works. Our light experience. Our, li our light of reproof exposes sin's shame. It exposes the shame of sin. Look at verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Verse 12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Now here's how it works. Uh, the, the light of the gospel and the light of, of a Christian living out the implications of the gospel every day it exposes the shame of the sin in this world. The obedient Christian life exposes the shame of disobedience. And the, and the, and the shame is seen really in the contrast between the two. I used to ask my dad if I could do certain things with my friends. 
things that he would never let me do, but I was dumb enough to ask, amen? And I would plead my case with this critical piece of evidence. I would say, Dad, everybody's doing it. And he would say, Son, everybody's not doing it because you're somebody and you're not doing it. <laughs> I didn't understand then, but I know now. Now, the light of the Christian life says to this wicked world, No, not everybody's doing it because I refuse to go along with this. And see, the whole world wants everybody to be doing it. And when they see someone that's not doing it, they are convicted. Because there, something in the back of their mind says there's got to be a reason why they're not doing this. It's fun. We like it. Why aren't they doing it? You know that there was a time in Western culture that slavery was considered to be acceptable, to own another person, to beat that person, to misuse and mistreat that person. There was a time in our culture when that was acceptable. Why was such a horrible institution as slavery accepted? Well, it was because people were doing it. And lots of people, the majority was doing it. And when people think about everybody doing it, anything can seem to be acceptable. But then a few people began to stand up and say, we're not doing it, we're not going along with this, and we're not doing slavery. Men like William Wilberforce in England, and the abolition, abolition movement came across the Atlantic to the United States of America, and they divided, and there was a war resulting after the much bloodshed in the freedom and emancipation of an enslaved race. Why? Because some light exposed the evil of slavery that had previously hidden in the darkness. And so, here in Ephesians it says, it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Our reproof is to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our reproof of light exposes sin shames. And it exposes the extent of that shame. It, it speaks about how bad it really is. It exposes the works of darkness as being unfruitful. Look at verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Now what is fruit? What is fruit? Literally, it is the good thing that a plant produces. Right? Now, some of you are going to say, but vegetables. Just, just stick with me, all right, here. Uh, but fruit, or vegetables, I guess, we call it produce, all right? Fruit is literally the thing, the good thing that a plant produces. It's good for food. Uh, it spreads the seeds of the plant for reproduction. Um, and figuratively, fruit means the benefit of labor, the reward of doing what is right, or the return on investment. That's what fruit is. The works of light bear good fruit. There are many temporal fruit, very, very, many temporal benefits. And of course, there is eternal reward in the good fruit of the light of, or the life following the light. But, uh, but the works of darkness are said here and exposed here to be unfruitful. They bring no true lasting benefit. Now, in the works of darkness, there is, temporal, there is temporal thrills, temporal pleasure, but the, but the, the extent of that pleasure or the, the, um, the limit is, is time, right? Time and repetition and exposure and, and the pleasure is gone, replaced by death. They bring no true lasting benefit and they add up to eternal loss. And more than that, the works of darkness produce shame, not good fruit. Paul wrote to the, to the church at Rome in, Rome chapter, or in Romans chapter 6 and verse 20. Listen to what he says. He says, For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and to the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so he says, what fruit did you have when you were servants of sin? You had fruit unto 
that you're now ashamed of. But now you have fruit into holiness that leads to everlasting life. You see the contrast there? And so we're commanded to refuse to participate in works of darkness because they're unfruitful. And rather, we are to reprove them, to expose them, and convict and convince them as evil and as darkness. And, and when we refuse to participate in them, we expose them for what they are. Shameful, harmful, not healthy. And so, um, the light of reproof exposes the extent of sh sin's shame in that it, it, uh, it exposes the extent of that shame and, and it exposes um, that the works of darkness are unfruitful. It also exposes that the works of darkness are unspeakable. They're unspeakable. They're, they're, they're a shame, he says here in verse 12, it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Unfruitful, unspeakable. What is Paul saying here? Let me tell you first what he's not saying. He's not saying that if Christians speak about these sins of the world that they will be ashamed. That's not what Paul's saying because Paul himself wrote about three dark sins in this chapter. Verse 5 and verse uh, in verse. Three, Paul mentions fornication and uncleanness and covetousness. And certainly, Christians must not speak of these things in, in a crude or crass manner, but we must address them. Paul did. And so he can't be saying that we should be so ashamed that we never mention them. Um, so what is Paul really saying here in verse 12? That it's a shame to speak of them. Well, Paul is expressing not only the shame of sins hidden in the darkness, but he is exp he's explaining really the extent of this shame. He's saying these things are so evil that one does not want to bring them up in polite company because, because they just carry with them, they cast this, this shadow of shame over the very concept. The word is, uh, the, the world is learning this the hard way. I mean, how many celebrities have gotten in trouble lately for sexual harassment in the, bar in the workplace, right? And how, how more, many more times are these things going to come up? And, and it is a shame even to speak of them. And the people who have their names connected to them, their careers are damaged. Their reputations are in tatters. Why? Because what was in the dark came to light. Not necessarily exposed by the gospel, but exposed anyway. Now how do we expose darkness that is shameful to the extent that is, a, that is unspeakable? I mean, we can't really, we can mention it, we can address it, but um, when discussing it, we shouldn't be graphic or crude. But the, we expose this darkness um, by living the light in an example. We live the light by example. We refuse to participate in it or to give approval to those who do. That is, that is how our light exposes works of darkness as unspeakable. The, the, the extent of the darkness, the extent of the shame is so much that it is unspeakable. And then reproof of light uncovers the hiding place of sin also. In, in verse 12 again, at the end of the verse it says, it's a shame to speak of those things that are done of them in secret. Sins like to hide in secret places. You cannot know what goes on in other people's lives in secret. You can know what goes on in your life and God the Holy Spirit can address that and expose that uh, to your conscience where you can get it right. But you know, when it comes to our ministry and being a light in our community, you can't know what's in everybody else's heart and life. And by the way, you don't need to know and neither do I. All right, It's not our job to dig up dirt on everybody and tell them about it. Rather, the way we shine uh, uh, light on these things in, in their conscience is to live our lives in the light. And the, the exposure becomes obvious in the contrast. Now, our light must reprove the darkness of this world. That's, when we bring glory to God, that's what is accomplished. It is reproving and exposing light, and it exposes sin's shame. Is that all it does? No. What else, what else can light do in darkness? 
Our light then, our light of reproof gives evidence of our salvation. It gives evidence of our salvation. It proves that we really are children of light, children of God. As they used to say, the proof is in the pudding. I'm not sure why that, I'm not sure how that works, but I don't usually look at pudding for proof, but, um, but the idea is that it proves that we are really children of light. It proves our authenticity gives evidence of our salvation. Verse 13 says, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Our light of reproof gives evidence of our salvation. To drive that point home, Paul gives an illustration and an application. He illustrates the truth and then applies it to our lives. Here's the illustration. And that's found in the very first part of, of verse 13. All things that are reproved are made manifest by light. He's saying light by its very nature reveals and exposes things. Um, the illustration is universally understood and it is simple. If you can see something, you can see it because there is light reflecting off of it. Right? Um, and so it, it, anything visible is made visible... By the light. That's the illustration. The light performs an action and makes things visible. Now here's the application. All right? The application is this. If you are light, you will reveal and expose things. All right? uh, look at what it says here. and there's a, there's a subtle difference in the two clauses of this sentence. It says, um, all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. And look at the second clause. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And so in the first clause you have by light and in the second clause you have is light. And so he's saying if you are light, the application is this, if you are doing what light does, then you are what light is. All right? Does that make sense? If you're doing what light does, then you are what light is. Um you know what Satan, the ruler of darkness, wants more than anything? He wants those living in darkness to look at you and say with confidence, you're a fake. You're not genuine. You're not a real light. Satan does, he does not need you to slip up just once and have ask for God's forgiveness. No, he needs you to live a life pattern of darkness. That's what he wants in your life. A pattern of sin and of darkness. Christian, your enemy, the, the devil, needs you to live a pattern of fornication and uncleanness and covetousness that, that the Apostle Paul mentioned in verse 5. That's, that's what the devil needs you to do. He needs you to speak in foolish and filthy language. He wants that to be the pattern of your life. He needs you to be unthankful as Paul noticed here in, in verse uh, 4. He needs you to do those things so that there will be a bushel basket over your lamp. And it will not shine and expose what is in the dark. And he needs you to do this as a pattern of life because when you refuse to live that way and instead you choose to imitate God your Father, your light shines and His light shines through you and proves you to be the genuine article. It proves you to be authentic. And the world and the devil cannot point at you as a fake light and use you as an excuse to continue to live in their darkness. So our light must reprove the darkness of this world. That's, that's what it must do. That's how it must function. And so it exposes sin's shame and, and it gives evidence of our salvation. But there is one more and one very important function for our life before we're finished here this morning and for our light. And that function is always foremost on the heart of Jesus Christ who came to seek and to save the lost. And that is this, our light of reproof evangelizes lost sinners. It's, it is an evangelistic tool in the hand of a merciful Savior. It is not a gavel, you know, it's, it's not a gavel for us to play whack-a-mole with people that we think we're better than. 
It's, it's not for us to whack people down and, and, uh, and prove ourselves to be the superior people. That's called self-righteousness, but in a gospel-centered and a Christ-centered life that is reflecting the light of Christ, our light of reproof points them to the Savior that they need. Light of reproof calls sinners to repentance, and exposure of sin highlights the need for a Savior, and our light of reproof evangelizes lost sinners. Verse 14 says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Light of reproof calls the sleeping sinner to awake. Now, if you see someone sleeping, maybe give them a nudge right now, right? Uh, but no, light of reproof calls the sleeping sinner to awake. Now, what is Paul quoting here? It says, wherefore he saith. So Paul is quoting something, and it's, Quite possible, and he's not quoting anything word for word from the Old Testament, which is usually the formula you would have here in a New Testament quotation, but it is possible that Paul is rewording and loosely quoting Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1. That is a, a great possibility. Um, but it may also have been an early Christian hymn that they would sing at baptisms, and that would be very, very appropriate for them, and it could be both. Uh, it would be very appropriate for them to sing at a baptism where people were, were being baptized and publicly claiming Christ and perhaps doing so before lost family members and people of the community. And as they were doing that, they may sing this hymn, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Can you see that in your mind's eye? Maybe outside in the Jordan River maybe in a tributary somewhere, baptizing people under pain of persecution and death and willing to claim Christ. And, and that, that very act, that very light shining and calling sleeping, sleeping sinners to repentance. Whatever the case, Christ calls the sinner to himself and the light of reproof calls the dead sinner to arise. That's a, that's a miracle, by the way. Uh, for the dead to rise, but here it says, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. Light of reproof calls the dead sinner to arise. Light of reproof comes from Christ through us. And it says, now I want you to notice the word wherefore at the beginning of this verse. It says, wherefore he saith arise and uh, uh, awake and arise, and Christ will give thee light. Now, wherefore connects this thought with the previous thought that, that, uh, that Paul was just expounding to us. And whatever makes manifest is light. Look at verse 13. All right? Verse 13. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And so he says, Awake, sleeping sinner, arise, dead sinner, and Christ will give you that light that you now see in the saint. Remember verse 13 exposes, our light of reproof exposes that we are authentic, that we are really believers. And so they see this, and so the word wherefore connects it. It says, you see that light, now you arise, and you um, awake, sleeping sinner, and Christ will give you that same light that you see shining through a genuine Christian. Several of you came to Christ because you saw the light of Jesus Christ in someone else's life. Maybe you had a friend who was the real deal. Maybe you grew up in a Christian home and you saw the reality of Christ in your parents. Maybe you didn't grow up in a Christian home and you thought it was all fake until you met someone that, that lived it. And you saw the change in their life. You saw the light shining and you knew you didn't have it. And so the gospel reached you through them. However the case is, many of us saw light of Christ in somebody else's life. And that piqued your interest and the gospel became genuine to you through the light of their life. And we must do the same for others by the Lord's power. That's why Paul says, Wherefore, awake thou that sleepest, arise and Christ will give thee light. Are you convinced now that your light must be a reproving light? 
that we go against the grain, that we don't just go, we, we don't just mind our own business and, and, and shut up and try to get through as smoothly as possible life. But we are to be a reproving light. If you're convinced of that, then go out of here today and shine for the glory of God.